Hey, and welcome to another episode of Shane Plays Geek Talk. This episode, we're going to be talking with George McDonald, who is the co-creator of the Champions superhero RPG, uh, and also the uh, co-founder of Hero Games. Now, George has also done a lot of work on important computer RPGs like Pool of Radiance and others. However, we're not really getting into that with this episode. This is much more focused on Champions and his role-playing game design work, his tabletop role-playing game design work. I have linked in the show notes, so if you go to shameplays.com, find the show notes for this episode. There's a link to a Matt Chat episode where my friend Matt Barton interviews him uh, and they go into much more detail on his work with uh, computer role-playing games. So some of the highlights that you can expect are the origins of champions from the why to the playtesting to the launch and beyond. Did the initial reception to the game disappoint or encourage? George came out of wargaming and his RPG mechanics reflect that. Did early players prefer to play licensed characters or their own superheroes? Crunchy versus streamlined game mechanics. Estimating the damage between dry and wet avalanches. Why did George decide to do superheroes for his RPG game genre? Or his first RPG game genre, I should say. The difference in adventure structure between RPG genres. For example, fantasy versus cyberpunk versus superheroes. Some of the business thinking behind printing a game and creating a company, which are two different things, actually. Game distributors dangled the carrot a lot back in the day. The great Hero Games box shuffle of the early 80s. A speed round of champions questions for George from Facebook, the uh, World of Supers uh, RPGs Facebook group uh, submitted questions. Those are at the end of the podcast. The pros and cons of wearing a cape. Foxbat's secret identity revealed. What term in sci-fi RPGs has always bugged me? And a little bit of chat, a little bit, about George's time in computer games, including Pool of Radiance. So, all that and more on this episode. I'd also like to give a shout-out and thank you to Michael Stewart, a.k.a. DM Mike, of the Save for Half podcast, who joined as a guest co-host. And I think you'll agree that he did a wonderful job. So, with no further ado, here we go. Why, yes, I believe we shall. Oh, I got a live one here. (laughs) Getting geeky all up in your podcast. It's Shane Plays Geek Talk, a journey into the things we love. I'm your host, Shane Stacks. Thanks so much for pressing play. Uh, You know, this episode, I, I love all my episodes I do. I love all my guests. But I've been, I've been geeked for this episode. I've actually been almost nervous waiting on it because it's it's just going to be a really fun, cool episode uh, that's going to touch on a couple of areas that are very interesting to me personally. So we're going to be talking about a classic, classic, classic uh, and very important role-playing game from the early 80s. Champions First Edition, uh, which was not the first superhero role-playing game on the scene, definitely one of the very early ones, and it also broke a lot of ground uh, mechanics-wise. And it and it just it it's in in some it's still going today in in different versions, and and we've got one of the original co-creators and also a co-founder of Hero Games, George McDonald is joining us. So George, welcome to Shane Plays Geek Talk. Shane, thanks for having me. Man, I'm, 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 I'm thrilled. Uh, can't wait to get into this because I, I, I love getting into the history of role-playing games and the superhero genre has a special place in my heart. I do a lot of research on it. Uh, so to have, to have you join the show, uh, and to talk about this is, is just great. And, and then also we've got has been on the show before talking about uh, his game Victorious, which is a Victorian superhero RPG using the Sage engine, which is the same engine as like Castles and Crusades and et cetera. In fact, Troll Lord Games publishes it. Uh, and, and that would be, do you, do you want me to, 
and I can edit this. Do you want me to introduce you as Michael or Mike? What do you What do you care there? Uh, uh, go with Mike. Mike. Okay, DM Mike of the uh, not only the Victorious RPG, uh, but also a current co-host of the Save for Half podcast, and also a lot of people might recognize him and his wife DM Liz from uh, the um, Save or Die podcast. So Mike is no stranger at all to role-playing games, talking about role-playing games and role-playing history. So Mike, welcome back. Yes. Glad to have you. you in the studio. In the, in the virtual studio. <laughs> That's right. So uh, would either of you like to add anything to that short introduction? And I will, uh, I'll let George go first and then we can, we can bring Mike in as well. But George, do you, would you like, well, I mean, I need to mention the, the most of the focus today is going to be on champions because, you know, to try to cover everything you've done, there's no way I can get it done in, in one podcast episode. Uh, you've also just had a really wonderful interview with Matt Barton on Matt chat. And I'll link that in the show notes. People go to shameplays.com search for, uh, or you'll see the, the episode notes for today's episode. And I, if you're interested in, in George's career at all, George's career at all, or, uh, which also involves computer RPGs, including pool of radiance and some other major names, definitely go check that, um, that interview out but uh george in addition to your uh time uh with ssi where you worked on some very important games uh, it's really hard to it's really hard to state how important pool of radiance and eye of the beholder are to computer R rpgs and you also worked at i believe was it accolade or acclaim was accolade accolade was there anything else you'd like to add uh to make sure people know about about before we get into champions. Oh, happy to get into champions. Uh, although uh, there are so many different editions, we we may stray away from just right. the first uh, as we go through this. So, yeah, that's that's fair. Uh, you know, uh, wherever you want to go with it. You know, I definitely want to establish the history of champions and your contribution to it, uh, but and and hero games. But you know, we can take it wherever you want. Um, Mike, did you want to add anything to that uh, quick introduction I did for you, sir? Uh, might also mention that Liz and I co-host the Crusader podcast. Oh, fantastic. I didn't know about that. So there you go. Um, you, you are prolific podcasters. Uh, yeah, I don't know where I find the time, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> well, thanks for making the time tonight. So, uh, you know, George, before we get into champions and and, and these other things, uh, and you know, I, again, I don't want to make this episode about your uh, computer game development and your time with uh, SSI and, and Accolade and all that. But I have to tell you, and I'm, I'm imagining you've heard this many times, but you have no idea how strongly Pool of Radiance knocked me upside the head the first time I saw it. It, mm -hmm. it was It's a foundational... Import. I mean, I consider it one of the best computer RPGs of all time. Uh, I have an ongoing save that I still fire up and play on my desktop. Oh. Uh, what when I saw D and D to that level on the computer, it blew my mind. You're and, not running it on a sixty-four. <laughs> well, <laughs> I've I I have an emulator, but oh, no, well, I, I cheated I and I'm doing. Yeah, I'm playing the good old games version, but I've got I've got an Amiga over here. Don't make me don't make okay. me fire it up on my Amiga. <laughs> um, but uh, you have no idea that the detonation that went off in my brain when I saw Pool of Radiance. Um, it it blew me away that you could play D and D to that level with on a computer. You know, I'd seen computer games before that. Uh, but I was like, you mean I can play real D and D when my friends aren't around to play. And, and, and it, it just sucked me in on a level that it's hard to describe. So, um, I, I really enjoyed the part of the Matt chat, you know, interview with Matt Barton where, where you went into pool of radiance. And I love the little nuggets you drop like Westwood's contributions and, and that sort of thing. So, um, 
And, you know, I could, that. there were a lot of, a lot of people worked amazingly hard. I mean, teams now are way bigger, but at the time that was by far the biggest team Sasai had ever put together and were all tabletop role players and computer role players and they all just kind of sat around and said, you know, how can we try to make sure that includes everything we could think of from D and D that we could squeeze into a eight bit computer and uh at the same time, the people from TSR, especially Jim Ward, was you know, he he was watching us very closely because they weren't a hundred percent sure we could do a good job. They weren't sure anybody could. Um, and when we showed them what it was, they were kind of like, "Yeah, this kind of this kind of feels like D and D." So go for it. So it, it was a, a lot of work, but a tremendous accomplishment for the whole team. It, well, it's, I mean, anytime you, you know, look at lists of important computer role-playing games and I mean, the, you know, the gold box series always comes up, but, you know, Polar Radiance just crazy. Um, you know, I do, and, you know, I'm, Matt Barton, you know, allowed me to come along as co-author on uh, his Dungeons and Desktops, uh, you know, the history of computer role playing games, second edition. And I mean, if you've ever flipped through that, that book definitely gives love to pull of radiance. So moving on, um, folks, again, go check out, go to the, sh- the show notes at shameplays.com. And I've linked not only that interview with Matt Barton, which is, is just a really great interview going into the games that, George was involved with, but there's also just really fascinating tidbits on how the games were made or why certain decisions were made and, and, and that sort of thing. And then I've also linked, uh, or will be linking, um, when the post goes up, the, uh, the save for half episode 17, which is the champions first edition episode where the, um, the save for half the halflings isn't that what you call yourself uh, like halflings. The, halflings. the halflings uh do a deep dive on champions first edition so all right speaking of champions first edition listeners probably know but in case they don't in 1981 a game burst upon the market uh much like ben Grimm smashing through a wall uh, and saying it's clobbering time. And it, 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 a lot of people bought it. A lot of people liked it a lot. Uh, and it was a superhero genre game, which there weren't a lot at that time. Um, and it had, uh, I guess there was just something about it that, that, that this people really liked. Uh, and it, and like I said, it's, it's up to a sixth edition now. And it's called Champions. I I have a I have a confession George. When I was like 12, I was playing Villains of Vigilantes. I wasn't even aware of Champions. Um but I I'm definitely aware of Champions now and in the years since. Uh so I I'm glad to have Mike here because even though I have experience with Champions now, he has deep experience. Like he jumped on when it first came out. Uh, and played the heck out of it. So I, I I acknowledge its importance from its place in history as a superhero RPG, uh, and the mechanics wise, the the ground that it broke, and the fact that so many people love playing it, and also the hero system that came out of it. Uh, but I but I have to admit that but I was a, I was a villains of vigilantes guy growing up. So what is wrong with that? Well, it's weird. I was talking to Mike, actually. I picked up, for some reason, I was at a hobby shop, and I picked up issue number four of, it was at the Adventurer's Journal, which was the uh, the Adventurer's Club. And I remember reading in there, I was like, what is all it, bricks? And what, what is all this? And I was fascinated by it. And I was fascinated by the way that the formulas and the game mechanics were laid out. Um so that was that was my first exposure to champions, and then later, of course, over the years, you know, I've come to know it more and more. Um, and I, I actually went back and I got on Drive Through RPG, and I just out of nostalgia, I bought that uh, 
a PDF copy of issue number four again. And, mm-hmm. and I noticed in there, George, that you had editorial contributions. So um, at that point, I guess you were designing games and also help, helping with the newsletter. I'm, I'm going to turn it over to you now. I want you to tell us a little bit about about champions and and you know what what led to you um i guess getting it out the door you know you you speak a lot on that that podcast with uh matt barton about shipping right getting stuff out the door Uh, and i know there's a lot of people out there that um that start a project and for whatever reason can't get it out the door but you've gotten a lot of cool stuff um out the door but what what led you into this project when you were so early in your career to to tackle something like that and did you have any idea that it would go on to be as popular as it was well neither d peterson my original co-author and co you know owner for hero games had any idea where it was going to go when we started um I had actually started I was one of those people that that played three box, you know, three book D&D and the first thing I decided was I could do it better. Um and so I kept trying to invent new combat bits or new magic bits or whatever else and could never really get anybody to play them because they wanted to play the game that was in front of them. And I figured at some point, if I wanted to get anybody to play one of my games, I was going to have to come up with something that was wholly uh, my own. It wasn't just a, an addition to an existing game. And kind of going through college, scribbling in the margins of my Last notes, I kept coming up with different little bits that I thought would be interesting in a role-playing game. Around that same time, I was a big comic book fan. That was, you know, I had sort of come back to comic books when uh, the new X-Men were coming in, and uh, yes. I can remember the first issue where you actually saw, you know, Enter the Phoenix and uh being you know George Perez coming on to the Avengers and making it look completely different than it had looked before because every little detail was in every panel. And I sort of said, okay, I hadn't I'd seen some different uh superhero games. V and V had already been out and uh, a couple of other people had tried, but I said this this is at least not heavily trodden territory, so I could try this. Um, and I put together a playtest. And one of the one evening when we normally would have gotten together to play D and D, I dropped this kind of ten, twelve page document on my friends, and I said, "Hey, I got this thing. You want to try it out?" They were like, "Sure, well, why not?" And I think that evening we. People built several characters, and I could see people getting into the whole spending points to buy their powers and their skills and how much they enjoyed it. And um, we threw a bunch of dice at each other, and people really liked rolling whole handfuls of dice. (laughs) Um, And I kind of went, okay, we've got a couple of winners here. There's lots of things that are wrong with it, but uh, there was a couple of things that people seemed to really go for. Um, the superhero setting worked, the rolling handfuls of dice worked, and the point build stuff worked. So, and spent you know, quite a while, uh, over a year at least, I don't remember exactly how long, kind of refining the game with friends. And it kind of took over a bunch of the people, you know, would get together once or twice a week and, and play games and suddenly were a number of people all running superhero game. And I thought, you know, this is getting pretty close. We're, we've got something here that's pretty good. And I ended up visiting uh, my friend Steve Peterson and went to his house and I looked at him and I said, you know, 
the, the Origins Gaming Convention, which used to was the biggest thing at the time, uh, gaming convention wise, and it moved around the country. It was going to be in our hometown next summer. And I said, if we don't make this game now, we're never going to make it. So we're never going to have a better waiting? way to get it in front of people. So is this, but was this just before like the 81 origins? This, or was, about- this was, yeah, this was the, the, we saw 81 origins coming up and said, all right, oh, it's, what is it going to take? And we sat down and figured it out and figured it would cost us a little money and a whole lot of time. And we thought, I think we can do this. It was like, why not? You know, the, we figured what was the, how many did we have to sell to make our investment back? And I think we ended up printing 1,500. We had to sell about 300 or so to get our money back. And, um, and so that's what we did. We spent the next, I don't remember, six, eight, ten months rewriting things and getting it laid up and learning how to do layup and finding where print shops were and figuring out how to get a cover and um, finding an, an artist um, to who could do the cover and some interior artwork. Uh, and that cover artist was Mark Williams, who we ended up working with uh, for a lot of the early years at uh, Hero. And um, when it came time to do Origins, you know, we had all of our friends you know, running games and doing introductions. And so we just blitzed the place as hard as we could. And by the time we were done, we had a couple of contacts at some distributors that were willing to carry the product and steve and i were in the game business that's kind of how we got started well i'll i'll just uh comment that i picked up my copy at fall of 81 at a convention in atlanta can't remember if it was asgard or sega southeast gamers association but whatever it was it was one of those copies with the wraparound cover and the white print inside i saw that and i just i had to have it i think i blew my whole uh game budget on that one book from that guy's booth (laughs) for that Mm -hmm. con so mike i have to ask so from your perspective because when i saw like superhero rpgs as a kid i lost my mind like um you know village vigilantes marvel superheroes um you know, DC, I know, I know Marvel and DC came a little bit later. Uh, but when I saw Village of Vigilantes, like I couldn't believe that there was a superhero role playing game. So was that, was that your experience with champions or had yes. you been exposed to other ones? Okay. We had tried making a supers game out of Gamma World. And mm. that, if you know anything about some of the mutations in there, that doesn't work really well for supers. Um, but yeah, I had not seen Villains of Vigilantes till I moved to Texas in North Mississippi. The only game I ever saw in a local, we didn't even have a game store, we had a bookstore. They had a copy of Superhero 2044. Mm-hmm. By the time I got enough money to buy it, someone had already bought it. You were like, no! Yeah. So I saw <laughs> Champions and I said, it must be mine. And I grabbed right. it and took it home and we played the covers off that thing. Yeah. No, that comes through again. You know, I recommend people listen to the safer half, safer half episode because your, your love of the game and the system and all of that, you know, comes through for sure. Uh, so I, George, if I remember right, uh, in the research I did, so you needed to sell about 300, uh, to make your money back. If I remember reading right, you sold about a thousand, uh, at that origins. Is that correct? Uh, it sounds a little high, but I don't remember the real Does it? number. Okay. I believe it. Yeah. I, I don't remember exactly, but we, we sold way more than we expected to. And it was enough to convince us that we could keep doing this. So, uh, let me, since superhero 2044 came up, 
and again, I always want to verify my research because you know you can believe everything you read on the internet. Um, <laughs> so you had like some involvement, like you weren't a primary creator or contributor, but evidently you helped out a little bit with Superhero Twenty Forty Four. Is that correct? No, what had happened was um, I went to a convention. I'd seen Superhero Twenty Forty Four. And I'd seen Villains and Vigilantes before as well, and might have owned both of them. I don't remember exactly what order that I bought them in. I mean, at some point I owned them all. But um, I had went to a convention where some people had talked about some house rules that they had for um, basically buying powers with points. And I heard their description of it. And that was one of the things that pinged in my head that went, Ooh, that sounds like a good solution there. Um, the systems between what they had done and, and uh, what we ended up with in champions are completely different. They don't have very much in common at all, but uh, other than, you know, points and powers and such, but the idea you get inspired by what other people do and then you take it and run with it and try to make it fit what, what you're doing. So I, I always know that in any role-playing game, we stand on the shoulders of giants mm -hmm. going all the way back to, you know, the original chain mail and Igax and Arneson and those people, everybody else is just taking what was done and, and, uh, adding your own bit to it. Was it, uh, Jim Dunnigan said, designers create good rules great designers <laughs> steal them he also said experience is equal to games ruined so you know, uh, yeah he shipped more ruined more but also made more really really great hex encounter games than anybody like yeah didn't he like design half the ones in the early strategy and tactics yeah i was an s and t i as well before i got into Role-playing games, I was a Hex Encounter war gamer. I got into them about the same time as I got into D&D &D and then later other RPGs, but I started with Panzer Leader, and, which is lovely to drop on an 11-year-old, by the way. <laughs> um, yep. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I played them pretty concurrently throughout the 80s. You're talking about you were a big war gamer. One of the things that... Uh, they talk about in the champions episode of, of save for half. And I think DM Liz brings up the fact that in the list of essential um, items you need to play champions is, I guess the first edition, the first edition said you need a tape measure. Um, <laughs> so do you like, is that, was that from your war gaming roots, just defaulting to think that you needed that level of, you know, measuring where, where everybody's at, or, you know, did you feel like that? No, this, this tabletop version of, of this role-playing game, you really need to tape measure to, for the tactical combat. Um, I was absolutely inspired by the hex encounter war games in a lot of ways. Champions in the hero system at a tactical level is, is a war game. You know, it, every hex can potentially matter. Uh, you, range matters, cover matters. You know, if you're talking about flying, there's actually kind of turn modes. So how fast you can turn around depends on how fast you can fly. A lot of that stuff, I wanted to make sure that it worked as a as a tactical battle game as well as a you know, role-playing game as well. Um I think in some of those, you know, looking back on it was overkill, but was part of what made it exciting for me was to, you know, part of my job at Hero was the kind of simulation side. And I can remember back before the internet, you would call the library and the librarian would look stuff up for you. So trying to figure out Oh, how do you estimate how much damage an avalanche do <laughs> based partially on the velocity of the avalanche and the mass of the the density of the uh, material that's hitting you? Actually, 
kind of did the math <laughs> based on that. So is it, there's actually a, uh, Something in, I think it's in espionage originally, although it might have been in the later games that talks about the difference between a wet avalanche and a dry avalanche and how much damage it does and how fast it moves so you can try to outrun it. It's stuff like that was just what I did. Yeah, if you hear conversations like that in the wild, it's like the tribal mate, like the tribal call of of the geek or the nerd or the gamer. You know, if you hear somebody discussing how much damage an avalanche does with wet versus dry, you, you could probably go have a fun conversation with that person. If not, go ahead and just go right down the. The game. correct response is <laughs> um, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what season is it? What type of snow? What's the, yeah, what's, is it African or European? <laughs> so, uh, so it, you also, you, you, you mentioned that you are a game mechanic fanatic. Uh, would, would you still describe yourself that way? Or, or was that your, the way you were for a long time? Or do you still, I love crunchy game mechanics. I love them a lot. So, uh, I've mellowed out a little bit because I know a lot of other players that I play in games with don't love them on the same level I do. But but if you if you if I look in a in a role playing game rule book and I see a formula, I'm getting happy. <laughs> so um, would you still consider yourself on you know that that you love playing around with the mechanics like that? I absolutely love to play around with it. I'm more a dabbler these days because it's not my my actual profession anymore. But I I still will design games on the side that I find interesting. And um, I think my goal now is to streamline. I, I, I want to try to keep the level of fidelity that I can so that there are Differences that that make the game feel naturalistic, but if I can find a way to streamline the mechanics and the interactions and get rid of division and multiplication and um, gasp, even subtraction <laughs> and things like that as much as you can, um, you know the idea that you know, ultimately you know, adds are easier than subtracts and both are easier than multiplies and that's all easier than divisions and. Um, it's just a matter of can you make game mechanics that give you the feel that you want that are still streamlined enough that people can play them and uh, find them engaging. If you get roughly the same result, I mean, you can get it streamlined better. exactly the same result if you're careful. So, yeah, um, so you know, I absolutely look back at some of that stuff and go. <laughs> Yeah, if I was going to do it again, I'd I'd probably streamline this a lot. <laughs> We're scandalizing Shane over there. Yeah, I'm I'm gasping. Well, there was there's actually a really good discussion on. I know I keep referring to the the safer half episode, but if I remember right, there's four co-hosts, and yeah. two of them are more engineering, mathematical, and two of them are more artistic. And they were talking about game mechanics and what they preferred. And it and it went right down the middle, you know, by what kind of career did they go into? Um, <laughs> and I, I'm a I'm a computer guy. I'm you know I do development and interface engineering and that sort of thing. So I lo I love formulas and crunchy stuff. It makes me happy. But I I've had you know over the years I've realized not everybody likes that same kind of thing. So like you know I can appreciate a a streamlined mechanic like in five e advantage and disadvantage is very elegant absolutely instead of having oh well, i've got plus two from this and plus eight from this and negative three from this is it nope you either just have advantage or disadvantage and i can appreciate that uh but my inner 13 year old wants half a page <laughs> of algebra <laughs> so anyway i guess what it really comes down to is george do you prefer creamy or crunchy peanut butter <laughs> um i basically i uh, like the crunch but uh i also find it a aesthetically interesting challenge to smooth it over to smooth it so you you're you're seeking it's like the philosopher's stone 
the the quest of the philosopher's stone to turn was it lead into gold? Is that what it was? Um, the, you want a crunchy system that's creamy. <laughs> yes, I or or I want <laughs> I want to have the crunchy outcome or the feel of that. Um, yep. with as smooth a way into it as possible. Nice. All right, Mike, do you want to spread this analogy any further? <laughs> I uh, I like crunchy peanut butter, but I get the impression that you just like a handful of peanuts. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you were talking about first edition champions, and in some ways, when I remember that book, I think the most important four pages in that whole book is the example of play near the end. Because yes. what it did is it... People didn't know how do you run a superhero role-playing game. And if you were playing Dungeons and Dragons, you could do... You know, there was a rote thing. Okay, Everybody's in the tavern, they get together... They go down in the dungeon together. They find, they beat some monsters. They get some stuff, come back out. They train. You do it again the next evening. You do it again the next weekend. You might do other stuff. If all else failed, you could fall back on that. If you were playing a Shadowrun game, one of the things that they did in Shadowrun that was super smart is they set up kind of a generic Shadowrun adventure where a fixer would hire you, and mm -hmm. your um, hacker would, you know, take down the security and then your samurai would go in and, take a, you know, sneak through the part of the giant corporation headquarters. And then at the end, there'd be a firefight and you'd have to retrieve the, whatever the MacGuffin was. And you'd take it back to the fixer and get paid. And if all else failed, you could do the same thing the next and you would be just as happy with that. So an important thing for champions was to establish what is it that you do? And the idea was something happens. The bad guys try to do something. The alarm goes up. Heroes show up. They try to stop them. They do stop them. And the bad guys over to the police. The police thank you. You can do that again the next week. You can come up with other stuff. You can make it more complicated. We could tell all kinds of great stories. It was a default story. Worked. I think um, robbery is the default to a superhero game, what the dungeon yeah. crawl was to fantasy game. Well, I can't think of how many comic books, especially like in the 70s and 80s, probably 60s as well, where the first several pages of the comic book was the hero on patrol and interrupting a bank robbery, you know, to, to, to get the action going. So, um, you know, or I guess it could be that, you know, it was a way to introduce a new villain or, you know, something like that. Um, I love that, uh, that you were, you know, the comic book stories that you were bringing up. Cause that, that's such a great time for comics that kind of late seventies, early eighties, there were some really cool stories you know, you're talking about George Perez, who we've, you know, who's recently passed on. Um, you know, we're talking about the details. That, that's such a, a great time. I, I mean, I love the 80s. If I if I have to pick one time for comics that I could just camp out in, it would be the 80s. Hmm. I love the fact that, you know, you took that into into role playing. And what, was there any other genres that you considered? I mean, I love that you went with comic books, uh, but was there or superheroes? Because comic books can be more than superhero. Uh, but was there any other genres that you can remember considering? Like, I want to do something than fantasy. I want to do something, you know, so that I can engage my players to think differently. Do you remember thinking about anything else? Oh, when we were, I mean, I came out of fantasy first because I started with straight D&D. &D. Um, right. I think when it was time to make my own game, I was trying to find a genre that wasn't claimed, where there wasn't kind of a giant in the field that um, everybody just kind of went, oh, yes, this is obviously, you know, if we're doing fantasy, of course, we're doing D&D. If we're doing science fiction, of course, we're doing Traveler. I mean, that, but at the time, there were other games, 
and there was lots of great games out there, but it's kind of what's the default game in that genre. And so the idea that superheroes didn't have a default game yet it was you know nothing that was quite big enough to be that default. Um, that's why we did superheroes first. On the other side, you know, we quickly decided that we wanted to do other genres, and so pretty quickly we ended up doing espionage as we thought that, hey, this is modern. Uh, it gives us an excuse to expand the skill system and the, um, the weapons and equipment stuff, and a lot of the rules that we would write for that were things that people could then just pull into their champions games without um, it was kind of a champion supplement without calling itself that um, in a lot of ways that first edition of espionage plus the first edition of champions is really the complete game more than um, first edition champions on its own was just because it added so much of the non combat skill sets and other things. Why well, I bought espionage. I and I was very unhappy with Top Secret, but you know. <laughs> yeah, I think Top Secret was the only spy type uh RPG I bought, you know, back when I was what, twelve, thirteen or fourteen. But I want I want to sit back and camp out on the skills a little bit. Sure. Uh I wanna, you know, I I really want to paint the picture here for people that are listening. When Champions came out, not only was it like one of the first superhero role-playing games, but there weren't. I mean, the the super the role-playing game hobby was not established like it was now or like it is now. So yeah, you had some role-playing games out there, uh, but there wasn't a lot of stuff was still being innovated. I mean, there's innovations happening now, but in the early eighties, 81 coming up with a good skill system was still a big deal. Um, and I want to, I want to turn it over to Mike for a second because Mike, <laughs> Mike is not a huge fan of skill systems in games, but ah. he likes the, yeah, ba, we got a ba. He's uh, <laughs> Mike might as well patent the ball, uh, but, but he likes the skill system and champions. So what is it about the skill system and champions that you like, Mike? For one thing, I liked champions one E because you basically had a complete role-playing game in 64 pages. <laughs> that includes like a, a dozen NPCs in the back. Um, and, all the skills that you're realistically going to need are there. Um, you know, there's a few for flavor, like find weakness or, you know, security systems. But yeah, basically on the whole. Um, and I'll admit, when I was a kid, I got espionage because I wanted more, a bigger skills list. Because I thought, because well, at that time, I thought I played Traveler. So it's like, well, Surely we need more skills, right? Mm-hmm. So I got more skills, and I played that a while, and then it was like, well, we don't really need these. I mean, yeah. you want to be an accountant? You're an accountant, you know? <laughs> it's, yeah. You want to be a banker? Be a banker. You want to work on cars? That sort of thing. It was all just very elegantly done, and something uh, people not familiar with the original champions, it's D6 only. Only use D6s, and you use bunches of them. Like you were, like uh, George was saying earlier, handfuls of dice. Even today, Liz still talks about the joy of just picking up 20 D6 and rolling it. <laughs> uh, of course, then when it bounces off the villain, it's less impressive. But, you know, hey, you, know, you still <laughs> got to roll the dice. You, yeah, you got to roll yeah. the dice. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I've gotten older, especially. I like just kind of what skill groups. Definitely was stripped down in the first edition. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I felt like everything that you needed for a superhero game was there. Um, 
Fair. And that is pretty impressive for what, 64 pages? Ah. Uh, to, to have a robust uh, that has everything in there um, for 64 pages. Like one of the most egregious examples that I ever went, you've got to be kidding me. Um, it was it was one of the versions of Fast's Star Trek role-playing games. <laughs> and I'm like, where's the starship combat? So I go, okay, and I look on this page, and I go to whatever page, and it said, oh, for Starship Combat rules, go buy the Star Trek Three Search for Spock Starship Combat game. Tactical Combat Simulator. Yeah, mm-hmm. and I went, what? <laughs> so, <laughs> so to get six to get a full superhero game into sixty four pages that had superpowers that's not easy right right uh it all in in skill systems and in in 64 pages well and when you were saying earlier about genres you know that's the beauty of the superhero system in a way you've done all the genres already Mm -hmm. got to be able to cover fantasy magic science fiction you know blasters or or espionage uh you kind of have to at least leave the system open for that sort of thing. I was just going to say, the other thing is you have the advantage of when all else fails, you can default to the way the world really works. So you knew that mm-hmm. most of your fans were comic book fans, and so they read a bunch of Marvel and DC, and you were pretty straight down the middle comic book style. We weren't trying to be Watchmen or anything that would have required that would have surprised anybody. Um, so if you just said you're in Chicago, well, people kind of know what Chicago looks like, or at least a comic book version of Chicago. There's a skyscraper and they know what a skyscraper looks like. Um, it's harder if you're doing a science fiction game because exactly what does a star doc look like? I can think of half a dozen different versions and you have to tell me which one is correct. But if I just say there's a skyscraper in Chicago, no. And you and I are on the same wavelength. Uh, even though I've only told you uh, one sentence about something. Um, and it's, so that kind of thing, there are lots of places that we could use shortcuts that we could get people into the game and for them to have a common understanding of the way the world worked uh, very quickly. That was just an advantage of running a superhero game. I, I think in a lot of ways, Dungeons and Dragons in the original form created a generic fantasy universe that everybody who plays games or nowadays even reads fantasy novels can share. You don't have to say much. And people will just fill in the, the the edges with the kind of generic fantasy that D and D has. Um, science fiction is harder because there isn't a generic science fiction universe. Um, yeah, not in the same way. There's a D and D. Yeah, even Traveler. Yeah, there's just such a big difference between. Playing Traveler and watching Star Trek and watching Star Wars and reading Honor Harrington books are very Star different Frontiers. from each other. Yeah. All right. So uh, getting back to, to Champions First Edition, and I, I want to kind of talk a little bit about, you know, you so you put this book out, it sold better than you expected. At what and you, you know, you even got picked up a couple of distributors at Origins. You know, that's sort of like a dream scenario for a lot of RPG developers, right? It's like, oh, it sold more than I expected, and I've got people interested in distributing my game. Especially back in the early '80s, when you couldn't just stick it up on the internet and people could get a PDF version. Run a Kickstarter, or, yeah, right. Run a Kickstarter. So that's that's I would consider that a very big success, especially, you know, you're just like, Hey, let's, um, let's put this together and hope we sell at least 300. So I wanted to ask a couple of questions here. One, 
uh, and I'll give you plenty of time to explore them because they're unrelated. Do you remember, and I know it's been a while, do you remember kind of how the division of the co-creation went between Steve Peterson and yourself? Uh, and do you know at what point you went, okay, we're going to make a company out of this. And then that became hero games. So I guess we'll take the first question, you know, do, do you remember kind of how the division of the original creation was between Steve Peterson and yourself? Well, I, I can remember some of the main points first, Steve was a better writer than I was. Um, I think I was more interested in the game mechanics part, although Steve was also uh, very good at the mechanics as well. But our split was more, Steve would do more of the writing. I would do more of the game mechanics. Um, there were also point places where I had to do writing, and then Steve would ruthlessly edit me. <laughs> And then uh, <laughs> Steve would either come up with some game mechanics or he would do some writing. And then I would lightly edit him because he was better than I was, uh, except for the game mechanics where I would ruthlessly edit his mechanics, make sure they fit <laughs> with the rest of them. Um, so that was really the split we had uh, between the two of us. In terms of making it into a company, I think as soon as we... It's when we first decided, after we went to Origins and we sold enough of them where we got together literally after the con, the con had shut down, it was that night, and we kind of looked and said, this has gone well enough, I, I think we want to keep doing this. And that's kind of when we decided to become a company. It was still a... You know, it was still a part-time gig for us, but the important thing we learned there from the uh, distributors, because the distributors, that was the bottleneck. We didn't have the internet. We couldn't post on any of these download sites or anything else. Um, so you had to say, how can we get th into the distributors so we can then get to the stores? The game stores was the way that users actually got the products. There wasn't a lot of mail order at the time. And what the distributors said was, yeah, okay, you've got one product. That's great. We see a lot of one and done companies. But we're not going to buy a lot of your stuff because we don't know if it's going to go anywhere. We said, okay, what do we need to actually be a real company? And they said, well, we need at least three products. So Steve and I sat down and said, okay, what's the fastest way for us to get two more products out? I said, okay, we need an adventure. We'll make a Game Master screen. Those are products. They count. And <laughs> so we did the Island of Dr. Destroyer, which I uh, probably yes. wrote a little more than half of that one. Um, and we laid up the Game Master screen and we got that out there and Distributors went, wow, okay, you got three. Well, we kind of lied to you. We really think five is more important <laughs> than three. Oh, my goodness. We said, okay, I, uh, we'll do another adventure and we'll do a book of villains. That was the first enemy's book. I don't even remember the next adventure. We got to five. And every time we turned around, they would say, oh, well, you know, if you, you, you say you've got a game, but it's just a book. Real games are in boxes. This was at a time when <laughs> real role-playing games were in boxes. You couldn't just sell a naked book. We went, okay. Well, boxes are expensive. And there's kind of a minimum yeah. run size for the boxes. We looked at it and we said, I'm, I'm not sure we can sell enough champions boxes by themselves that's why we decided to do espionage because we'll get half our boxes will say espionage and half our boxes will say champions ah so we knew we kind of did, wanted to do the uh, the spy genre because we also didn't think top secret kind of owned that we thought there was james bond and there was options that you know might be things that people would want so had the boxes made, and then one day, this truck pulls up. They open up the back, 
and it's full. It's this giant truck, and we're going, oh my God, where are we going to put all these things? <laughs> <laughs> to put this stuff. I love these kinds of stories because it shows the business realities and the logistics behind the creativity and the, you know, people don't know the stuff you've got to deal with when you go into business for yourself. So what did you do with all these boxes? We just cleared as much space as we could and just piled them to the ceiling and kind <laughs> of had to shimmy around them for weeks and weeks while we got the rest of the pieces together. You know, figured out how to order dice and figured out how to put stuff together. And the next thing you knew, we had two boxed games. At some point, the distributors kind of went, I, I guess you guys are real. I guess we will have to order some if you come out with a new product. Is the second adventure Viper's Nest? Or is that, that was in the box set? It was though. in the box set. I think that was so in the box set. was that... Okay, so that would have been separate from the separate second adventure they demanded. Yeah, I think so. Uh, I think so. So was were was this like the enlist all the family and have them packing boxes or uh you know what 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 did the weekend, what did the company look like? Packing instead yeah. of gaming. <laughs> yeah, it's like, hey, I'll buy you pizza if you help me pack these boxes. Or what what did Hero Games look like at this time? So actually the, going back a little bit, the first version of Champions, the first edition, and we were trying to get ready for Origins. Um we were trying to save money everywhere we could. So we didn't have the printers collate pages. Because that cost money. Oh. So we just had a collation party at, at my mom's house <laughs> where we invited all our friends yes. over. We just took yes. all the pages and made books out of them, piled them up. And then we the printer we had worked with had given us a deal. They basically said um, it w- they wanted to charge us a certain amount to stitch the books, actually put the, the staples in them. We said, ah, we're running out of money. What if we came in and did that work? He said, well, <laughs> if you're just going to use my machine, I'll let you save half the money. So we took all those hand collated books. We took them down to the printer and one weekend, just ran the stapling machine to staple them all together. <laughs> After that first run, we didn't have to do that. We could actually afford to have the printer do the collating and stapling. Um, and uh, when we had to do the boxed games, we actually did find a company that um, could do the, the collating the boxes together. Um, but that really required us to upgrade our offices because we needed needed some warehouse space. And we found a place that was kind of in a vaguely sketchy part of town and had a garage at the bottom and some offices at the top and the up above it. And that's where we moved in and that's where Hero was for the the rest of its that three, three and a half years or so. Where Hero was around a total of about five years. Then it was merged with ICE. Um, what happened was is that we had at that time we'd put out champions up through the third edition. Uh, we'd done Fantasy Hero and some supplements for it. We'd done um, a sequel to espionage which was uh, adventure incorporated i think uh international or Adventure international that's what it was called yeah um okay. by then they were uh, the the distributors were okay with just selling games as perfect bound books we didn't have to deal with boxes anymore um but we had done all these different the only genre that we had outstanding that we hadn't really gotten to yet big genre was science fiction and we looked at that and kind of thought wow a science fiction for all the reasons that i just talked about that science fiction is hard to get everybody's same place we, we sort of were staying away from that one at that point 
Uh, we'd also added um, another partner, Ray Greer. So Ray was uh, very much the kind of salesperson, and um, he was way better than Steve Peterson or I were at dealing with distributors and uh, and actually doing sales. But we'd been at it for about five years, and we had a meeting at some point between Ray and Steve and myself, and we said, okay, we know how to do this now. We can continue to put out half a dozen or more products a year, you know, one or two new games a year. Um, we had authors. We kind of knew what we were doing. And... We looked at it and we said, are we going to be able to grow in a substantial way without getting a bunch of money from somebody? We'd grown organically. We'd, we'd taken out one loan that was substantial and paid it back. Um, so we knew how to do that. But kind of went, you know, I think all three of us have learned a lot of what we wanted to learn doing this. And organic growth was only going to take us so far. Um, and we all decided we wanted to do some other stuff. So uh, Ray, because he was the most connected person in the industry, in our group, went around and, and put the word out that we were interested in licensing out the hero stuff to another publisher. And we talked to several, and the people at Iron Crane Enterprises, ICE, uh, seemed the most simpatico with them, made a deal, and they ended up taking over the publishing, and they paid us a royalty, um, and had a great relationship with them. Ultimately, they ended up hiring, they went through a number of different editors, but um, Rob Bell was super important there as uh, somebody who loved hero just like we did and really wanted to make it great and you know pushed for you know the the improved versions of fantasy hero the champions fourth edition that i worked very closely with rob on and we sweated blood to get out and lots and lots of other products that that got out that that came out under his tenure and then other people through ice and then ultimately ice had some some problems as well and we ended up taking the license back tried working with a couple of other companies along the way uh martel sorian with them a little bit uh some really nice Champions people there Millennium. and obviously all the cyberpunk stuff has been huge for them so you know congrats on all their success um yeah. And then uh, finally it went through. Uh, we finally sold the whole thing off so that we weren't even getting royalties for it anymore. It went through a couple of owners uh, before it ended up in the current hands. Is that when Hero 5 came out? Uh, yeah. The, 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 I think the people that own it now are the ones that have done 5th and 6th edition. Okay. Okay. And there's... So that's one thing I was trying to kind of figure out uh sort of taking a forensics approach was going back through and trying to figure out when when you sort of took an active step aside so are george is it is it accurate to say that after fourth edition you kind of stepped aside or would you say you stepped aside because it sounds like when you handed it over to ice or not handed it over but when you did the business arrangement with ice Iron Crown Enterprises, uh, who also published Merp or published Merp, which is another favorite game mm -hmm. of mine, um, that you weren't as involved. So, uh, like, how involved were, were, were you with Fourth Edition? I was pretty involved in Fourth Edition because, especially the uh, rules, kind of massaging the rules for Fourth Edition. Um, would have long phone calls with Rob Bell about the way different things worked, um, how we wanted to streamline it. There were other parts that Rob just took and run with. He had, he had great instincts, so 
I was always very happy with uh, the way that those parts of it turned out. Um, it was still a, a part of the relationship and part of how we earned our royalty was that we would still uh, review manuscripts and send back notes and approve them. Uh, fourth edition, the fourth edition champions book was uh, something that I was very heavily involved with for a lot of other books that were like more adventures and stuff like that, where I would give them a much more light reading because I was just looking mostly for are the game mechanics turning out correct and things like that. Um, probably one or two things in retrospect that would have took, would have looked at a little more closely, but uh, in general, Bob and the ice and the people at ice were trying to do a great job and they really up to the, the quality of the books above whatever we did when we were just doing it at hero. Um, part of it is because they had a team that did not only the hero stuff and the Middle earth stuff, and they did a lot of different things. So they had a, a bigger team and a more professional team than we'd had, and they really upped the quality level. The more I read through ice or not ice, but middle earth source books, mod adventure modules. Every time my respect for iron crown enterprises goes up more and more, they, they did such a great job, you know, working in, in the Tolkien lore. Um, sorry, I interrupted you, Mike. What were you going to say? Um, well, I was going to ask a question. One of two I've always wanted to ask, and I know it's been 40 plus years. So if you don't remember, that's cool. But I remember I was a member of the Adventurers Club almost when it first came out. I think I got issued two. I got the quarterly newsletters and all that. And I remember when Fantasy Hero was first coming down the pike, I ran a competition to name the game. Uh, Fantasy Hero was just going to be a working name. Yep. And it then came out as Fantasy Hero. So my first thought was, so did nobody submit a name or were the names just terrible? I, you know, it wasn't that they were terrible. Um, we actually thought long and hard about that. Every time one would come in, we would kind of go, oh, maybe that's it. And, you know, you'd say it and you'd try, oh, does that rip off the tongue? And what is it? What do you visualize when you hear it? And it was just an example of we'd used the code name so long that nothing else that somebody re recommended or suggested felt like that they all felt too narrow. We were trying to create the fantasy game that you could use to make the fantasy adventure, the fantasy you could make the you could run the fantasy game of your dreams. We were trying. We were very much trying for the toolkit approach, and in retrospect, that's not the way the kind of the world went. You know, we were probably we probably missed the boat there. People didn't want toolkits; they wanted flavor. Um, and so yeah, there was a time in the early mid '80s where it seemed like gamers pulled away from toolkits. And wanted to do wanted like you said the flavor, and uh, so I think that I think that actually hurt Fantasy Hero. The name mm. was kind of what it was. It was system fantasy rules, um, but I, I do think in retrospect, had we selected one of those clever names and then. You know, wrapped it in a cool, you know, even if it was a relatively generic fantasy with one or two spiky bits that would help people memorize it, <laughs> um, we probably we might have been more successful. Okay. That had just always what bothered me from the beginning. It's like, which, wonder what it was. <laughs> what happened? <laughs> yeah. All the things that we latch on to in our youth. Yeah. So I, I think it's actually a pretty smart, from a marketing perspective, like if you, like you got champions, right? So it's not 
you're not calling the game superhero hero, even though at that time, and maybe even still superhero is trademarked um, or copyrighted or whatever. By Didn't they call uh, it the super like, role-playing game? Uh, the, the original play test was actually, I think, uh, just called superhero. And, and we knew that that was copyrighted or trademarked so that we couldn't use that. And we had champions, superhero role-playing game and then we had to shorten that champions the super role-playing game because we didn't want to get into legal trouble you're right didn't want you didn't want marvel to come after you um yeah it's been interesting watching dc jump through all these hoops to come up with other stuff to say besides superhero um meta heroes the meta gene <laughs> um but i mean from a marketing perspective if you think about it like you, so you've got champions. That's the super role playing game. But if you have fantasy hero, or sci fi hero, or spy hero, or whatever, I mean, you could have had sort of a marketing. You know what I'm saying? Like anytime you saw that hero, you knew that it ran off the the hero system. We thought of that. So were you were you officially calling it the hero system at that time? Yeah, we I think by the time we did espionage, we called it that. The yeah. hero system. I love the, I love the, um, I don't know the the little logo or whatever of the hero system where it's almost got the, the figure stretching out his arms and legs, almost like the Leonardo da Vinci kind of, you know, that's, it's very eye catching. So in tights. I like that yeah. a lot. Yeah. <laughs> um, little guy in the heck. And also I got to get the, uh, boy for 1981, you know, I was looking through the rule book again recently for 1981, especially. And even for now, you guys nailed the character sheet. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, even putting little dotted lines to help people draw in there. I mean, that the body who, who form. Came up with, yeah. Yeah. Who came up with that? That was, I mean, you nailed it. You owned the, the superhero character sheet like George Lucas owned the laser sword. That was, <laughs> I mean that was well done. Who came up with that? Um I'm I could be remembering it wrong, but I do think that um having the character outline was one of my ideas. Um well, it's it was it was very smart for cuz everybody wants to see what their superhero looks like, but not everybody's an artist. So oh. that was very smart. Oh, we photocopied those onto our D&D or Traveler or all sorts of character sheets for just about any game because they were just perfect for that. You know, the, the the outlines on the character sheets remind me of that. I think it's still around, but like in the early 2000s, I used it all the time. There was like the hero. F it was online and you could make fantasy or superhero characters online by mixing and matching parts. The Hero Factory? Yes. That was it. Was that, did that come out of, did that come out of oh, hero games? That was somebody else. Uh, okay. Cause the, the art styles are very similar. So I, I would say they were probably inspired <laughs> by your work. Um, Interesting to see if all of these new AI art generators can end up creating comic book looking characters. I haven't seen any that do it well yet, but some of the AI generated art's getting pretty, pretty cool looking. So. It's it's getting pretty amazing. I've seen some really cool stuff. I I actually saw I think it was just yesterday somebody took a page just one page from the panels uh uh one page from Batman the Killing Joke and they described panel by panel to the AI art mm -hmm. software to see what it would come up with. Um uh, so it you know, I was like, well, in this panel, here's what's happening. And here's, it's, it's getting pretty sophisticated. Um, so I got to ask before I forget. And I, and, and I know this is a hard question, George, because, uh, it's like choosing a favorite <laughs> child. Uh, if it, not from like, it's the best or the writing is the best or, or any of that, because every edition is going to have good things. But is out of all the editions, let's say up through fourth, and I'm going to ask you this as well, Mike, because I know you played first, second, and third. 
So as a player, I want this perspective too. But George, out of out of edition one through four, which edition are you like? Do you think captures like you're like that is the best? Not you know there may be other editions that had stuff that was really super cool, uh, but just like a best all around, I think that's that's the edition. I have a and beyond the the first edition book, which has you know a whole bunch of emotional resonance for me, but I know. There's a lot of things in it that we ended up doing better in the future. Um, fourth edition hardback, the, what became known as the Big Blue Book, BBB. Um, I just played the heck out of that for years and years and years. That was when I wanted to run a role-playing game for somebody, no matter what genre or idea I had, I'd pull out the hardback, through it, make a list of what the constraints were for this particular world, this particular genre or, or game, and uh, tell people go to town. Let's let's play a game. So, uh, I love that you play it. I love that you kept playing it. Like you didn't just say, "Oh, I'm gonna," because I gotta, I gotta do a fourth edition, so I'm gonna do. It. I mean, I love that you're you're a player not just a developer, but like that you played it. Yeah, I will, I'll admit I haven't, I don't play it as much anymore, partially because I ended up moving, um, went to a new place and I haven't really established a setup yet. And partially just because of time. You know, once you get married and have kids, it yeah. gets harder. Um, but oh, I had adulting. <laughs> playing champions and running it for people and i will admit i'm a better game master than i am a player um i tend to get antsy as a player i want to keep doing stuff all the time so it's uh, easier mm. for me to be a, a gm yeah about the only time i play these days is at cons or one shots of some I'm, I'm much more of a dm and a gm these days than i am a player um what about you mike what out of first through third do you have a favorite? Well, I'm always going to be first edition. That's the one I'm most comfortable with, the one I enjoy running most. If I was going to introduce somebody new to Champions, I think I would probably give them third edition. Um, yeah, just because that like more... It's more comprehensive, you know, had, yeah, and, yeah. And, and does more of the, the granular explanations that... No, I mean, I mean, the first edition was really good for its time for 1981, and certainly was a font of inspiration. But there's a type of gamer who who likes some nitty gritty, and I think third edition does that really well. Was there ever an actual second edition, or is that Champions Two? Oh no, there was a second edition. Um, when we put the game in the box, we. Oh, we right, revised right. it, and the important thing that happened there is be- to save money. That's the one with the black and white cover instead of the color cover. Oh, that's actually the second edition. I I assumed that the black and white cover was the first edition, and that the second edition was the color one. That's that's yeah, interesting. Sixty four yeah, page wraparound was the first edition. Yeah, I played fourth, and it's it's fun. But if I'm running it, I'd rather run first to third. But I think anytime you're trying to run me. a game, you want mechanics that just come to mind automatically. If it's the one you've run the most and you just, you know, without having to look anything up, it's a plus two, all this dice, you just want to make game mechanics run on rails. And so whatever you've run the most, that's the one that's going to be the most comfortable. And also at some point when you run something for a while, you find you find a way to run the game so that the speed bumps, the things the game doesn't do well, you don't emphasize. You direct the players and the action and the choices toward the things the game does do well. Um, Agreed. I mean, there were many things, getting back to Top Secret, that I love about that game. And I'm not just saying that because Merle's a friend of mine. Um, other stuff I, in it. At, for instance... You know, uh, 
uh, machine gun fire, for instance, that game does terribly, terribly. And, you know, <laughs> if you do James Bond, that sort of thing, you're going to have lots of machine gun fire. There's just no way around that. So, yeah, if you can get past those speed bumps, I, I agree. I think that's that covers it. Oh, and I have, a, I have a wild tangent to go on here. Right. I'm going to vent a little bit. Geek Gamer with a wild tangent? No way. <laughs> yes. All right. It's always bugged me that science fiction games call conventional gun slug throwers. I don't know why, but it, it, you're not throwing a slug. Can we come up with something better than that? Well, what do you call it? I don't know. Pellet gun? I mean, strictly me. speaking, that's accurate. But, of course, yeah. say pellet gun. and P- c- c- Combustion. I don't know, but thrower. It's not throwing it. You could just say firearm. <laughs> I, yeah, there, there you go. That'll work. I don't know. That's just always bugged me. All right. Anyway, back to the... <laughs> I now return you to the to the show in progress. Actually, actually, the weapons were one of the things that were one of my responsibilities. So, coming up in Fantasy Hero with all the different, you know, medieval weapons and how they statted out, and coming up in the different um, champions and other hero system games, how all the guns statted out was part of my responsibility. And every once in a while, I would meet people who knew. Way more about guns than I did, and I would have to kind of say, "Yeah, okay, we did simplify yeah. that some." And but, uh, yeah, well, what I, what isn't I, that fun? When, when those people, oh, yeah, it's right. like, yeah, they want to they want to talk about the yeah the gas compression ratio of the yeah. chamber that pulls back and inserts. And they the were right bullet. a bunch of stuff I didn't know. But as a friend of mine once put it, he says, "If the game master thinks that the Viking longboat." is the absolute best ship for moving up and down the coastline of a world. And in that world, that is the absolutely best ship running up and down the coastline. Yep. And I don't care if you know about some other kind of, you know, Polynesian boat or something Actually, else. Actually, the Caravel would, uh, you know. Nope. Uh, if the Game Master says that's the best. Nope. And... Oh, their game it. go with it <laughs> yeah that what one of the things that i run a, a weekly game and one of the things that that i'll say when we start getting into deep details like that is i'll be like i mean this is honestly interesting but at a certain level this is a game not a reality simulator right there has to be a point where you go we we just we have to have rules that 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 you know, adjudicate the situations and move on. Yeah. Because, you know, it's not, we're, we, it's not the matrix. It's not supposed to be replicated down to, you know, the, every individual atom of reality, but you know, a lot of players have their hard time getting their head, their, their head around that. But as a, as a GM or a DM, you're wanting to allow them the latitude to ask the question or bring it up, but you don't want to, you know, you want to move it on at a certain point. Well, yeah. Right? I'm, I'm running a moral project game right now. And I got a guy who's running a, a medical doctor. In his real life, he's a medical doctor. No, no, you. I got another me. guy who's playing an electrical engineer. He's really an electrical engineer. That's a yeah. lot of fun. Yeah, there comes a point where you go. It's a game. Yeah, there's rules. They're not. You know, we got to move on. So, I I got another question for you, George. Um, so. You, this came out in eighty one. It originally came out in eighty one. Uh, what was was fourth edition eighty nine? Uh, I think ninety. A little ninety seven. Wasn't it? Ninety. Was it that late? Was oh, it? Oh no, no, you're probably right. Eighty nine ninety. Yeah, it would have been that eighty nine ninety. Which, by the way, it had a George Perez cover, so that probably it absolutely you. did. Um, I, I would imagine. Um, what? And and it, at a certain point, I don't know which edition it came in, but at a certain point, killing damage came in. I'm assuming that's to reflect the trend in comic books to more lethal what was that heroes or whatever. Was that the, was killing damage in the Ainged first edition? Hand to hand killing attacks were in the first book. Okay, I had right on that. Right, absolutely. Am I? Okay, I had assumed that it crept in uh, due to player 
desire because, you know, the, about the mid eighties, things got much grittier. So um, my question was, did that bother you to have to include that? But it's an invalid question. So I'll just strike that from the recording. I, mean, I, can... I always thought it was added yet because of Wolverine. Yeah. Let's okay. So let's explore that then. What, what was the reasoning to include that in, because of the 80, 81, we're still very much in the bronze age of comics. Um, some people would argue at that time that we were going in the modern age, but people quibble, but we're still pretty much in the bronze age. And at that point, death didn't happen a whole lot in comic yeah. books. Um, so what was the, and I'm not saying it was bad. I'm just curious, like what was well, the thinking there? Mark was right that, that Wolverine, you know, hand-to-hand killing attack you know, was how do you model Wolverine? And that was, that was there. And his killing attack was how do you model a gun? Um, part of it was there were certain things. There's a difference between you know, if you fire a gun at Superman, it bounces off. And there is something just fundamentally different between somebody who's, you know, a incredibly well-trained, tough human bullets still hurt and a superhuman who's about as resistant, you know, equally resistant to a super punch, but bounces a bullet when it comes at them. We wanted to model that in a way that made sense. Um, so that's why we had separate killing attacks and normal attacks. Now we made the killing attacks less. We had the, the stun multiplier mechanic in there in order to create wide variance, but make it so that there was a fair chance that using a killing attack against somebody that had some resistant defense was less effective than an equivalent amount of your damage. Um, there was a chance for it to be good. You could roll really high on the multiple. Um, but that was kind of playing the stun multiple lottery at that point. Um, right. The other thing is we made it so that um, you didn't die until you had taken twice your hit. You took all your hit points down to zero. And then you were kind of bleeding and things were bad. You had to take negative your hit points before you died. So actually killing someone is pretty hard, especially if you know anybody with some first aid could just jump on somebody and stabilize them. And body points were actually pretty cheap. So if you wanted if you were in a game where you where there was a lot of killing attacks going around and you didn't have much in the way of resistant defense could buy up to human maximum 20 body points and you'd be really hard to kill which modeled the kind of heroes you see in war movies and such where they take the bullet and they go and they grit their teeth and tie the tourniquet around it and keep going you know um we're not saying that didn't want to make bullets do too little damage so if you take a normal person and you shoot them with a pistol in the head and you look at all the multipliers, you can, according to the rules, kill a normal person in one shot, which, because that happens in real life. On the other hand, you could be somebody who's a hero in a movie and you're John McClane in Die Hard and you've taken, you know, body all over the place and you're still gritting your teeth and getting through it. So uh, it was a conscious, eff- conscious decision. And we knew at some point we wanted to do fantasy um, and people were going to be pulling out mm-hmm. swords and axes. So, so you, were, you were thinking on that level even then? Well, I, I think like... We we want to extend this to we want to extend this rule system to other genres even as far back as when you were working on. Well, I think I, I think Mike said it right. Where by definition, superheroes kind of subsume all the other genres. So right. you've got to be able to have right. blasters and 
powered armor. You've got to be able to have swords and plate mail. You've got to be able to have bullets and Kevlar. And you have to at least make a nod to all of those. If you're going to be doing a superhero game. Well, that leads me into another question. Um, Every every time that I listen to an interview or read an interview or or interview somebody who does superhero RPGs, they always talk about one of the biggest problems is how do you have Superman and Batman <laughs> in the same campaign or the same game using the same rule set, but do them both justice, you know, and, and the classic example is everyone talks about dc heroes and the meg system how that you know algorithmic or was it exponential system the meg system allows both superman and batman to effectively be in the same encounter so was that something you struggled with uh yes i mean just straight up yes we we did struggle with it um hero in retrospect hero actually works well in a relatively rare narrow range of statistics image and defenses and stun points and combat values and things like that it's it's not hard to get outside of that and what you can get to are situations that actually feel very comic book like but might not be much fun as a game because you've got somebody that always hits or never gets hit somebody that knocks every, you know, just blows everybody away with one shot or somebody who is invulnerable to everything. Um, you can play a game where that's what's going on, but you have to make sure everybody knows that the person who's invulnerable to physical blows had better be vulnerable to something else. Um, you know, energy or mental or some other thing so that they get to, have their great heroic moment where, you know, they resist the physical damage and no man could survive that or whatever. On the other side, they get ambushed by the mentalist and they fall down and they, and you kind of go, Ooh, okay. We got to make sure that doesn't happen again. Um, you know, so. Used to call that off board artillery. Yes. <laughs> um, off mentalist board. just hanging out there. Bing, 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 bing. Well, I love that when people have these super brick Superman type characters or whatever, and they went, they never take into account the, the, the psychic <laughs> just yeah. drop them. You're, yeah. You're immobilized. Yeah. Um, yeah. Imagine game balance when you're developing superpowers is, is a lot harder than, you know, two guys banging on each other with a sword. Um, so, well, I guess, I guess fantasy games, you have magic, which is an equivalent. Got a guy you know, banging with a sword on a giant, you know? Well, I mean, if you crank out a high-level D&D fighter, he's going to, you know, that's properly equipped, he's going to wade through a large quantity of, you know, low-level monsters and low-level other characters and things like that without taking a sweat. So you know, high-level D&D characters are... Effectively superheroes. Right. Um, so I've got, uh, I've got some questions here uh, from the uh, world of supers RPGs group on Facebook. Uh, we can kind of speed round. I'll start drawing us to a close. I know we're, we're getting close to time uh, before I get into that. Uh, you know, Mike, did you have any other questions you definitely wanted to get to with George? Uh, no, I, th I think I've, they're pretty much covered. I can ask off, off air if necessary. Okay. Uh, George, do you have any anything you definitely want to touch on before I kind of launch into this speed round of questions? Um, I, I guess the one thing that, that I want to make sure and mention is that one of the best parts of being um, part of Hero Games and then later working with people at Iron Crown when they were um, doing hero system work was working with all the different creators that made just amazing stuff for 
you know, under the hero label. Um, getting a chance to publish books by Aaron Alston was amazing. And Scott Benny. And I mean, I'm, I'm sure I'm not going to name all of them, but just getting to meet them, getting to work with them, getting a manuscript in the mail, because at the time we would get them on paper. Um, they would come in the mail and you'd read through something and you'd kind of go, oh, I never would have thought about that. That's so cool. Um, that was the best part of Hero was getting to work with just amazing other authors that had and getting to kind of see and understand their imagination. I mean, there are times when I'll still flip through one of our old books and it'll remind me of experience of working with somebody and it'll bring a smile to my face. So um, networking and, and working with all the people um, as well as, you know, just the thousands of hours of throwing dice with, you know, old friends and new friends that I got to meet uh, through the, and in the game biz. It was incredibly satisfying. I really appreciate it. And I thank everybody that I ever got a chance to do that with. Well, that's amazing. Um, are you still in touch with many of those folks? Some of them. Um, I mean, I still talk with Steve Peterson and Ray Greer on a regular basis. Uh, Bruce Harlick on occasion. Um, some, the other authors, uh, uh, Andy Robinson, a couple of others, other people, it's more occasional. I'll, I'll see them on Facebook or something and, uh, send a note or we'll see each other at a con or something, but yeah, try to keep in some touch. Of course, Rob Bell went into politics and has been in the Virginia house of delegates for a couple of decades now, I think. Oh, Wow. Now that you mentioned Bruce Harlick, I think was wasn't he the first hero employee besides yourself and Steve? Am I correct in remembering that? That's probably that? right. Yeah, I think so. Well, here's what I got to know before I launch into these questions from uh, Facebook: How satisfying was it to secretly be Foxbat? <laughs> well, I wasn't. That was Bruce. <laughs> <laughs> I love reading in the uh, adventures. Uh, adventures what was Club. it? What was the newsletter called adventures again? Club. The not the adventures with all the trash he would talk in the letters oh, yeah. column. That was so good. Well, I had to explain to my wife the the pun behind fox bat and yep. fandom. As we used to play I, I, the SPI game fox bat and phantom, which was a modern jet combat Phantom. game in oh. high school <laughs> in the math resource center. During break. So, old SPI nice. game. All right. Anyway, well, let me, uh, I know we're getting close to time. So, I'll, I'll try to, we'll try to do a speed round on these. And, you know, Mike, George, both of y'all, thanks so much for the time. I mean, I could just, I could sit here and just keep going and going <laughs> and going, but I know you guys have lives. So, I want to get you back to it. Um, thanks for inviting me. I appreciate it. It's been great. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Thanks for both of y'all for coming. Yeah, like I said, we haven't even had a chance to touch on any of your uh, computer game development stuff. That's a go listen to that Matt Chat interview, folks. That's like two hours of just goodness. Um, all right, so this is from the World of Supers RPGs on Facebook. I was like, hey, I'm going to uh, get the opportunity to talk to George McDonald, Champions, and, and I got a lot of questions back. People were excited about this, so. Uh, and, you know, just got a lot of likes in general. So first of all, here's a lot of, these are basically thank yous or similar sentiments. Okay. Uh, so got those from Christian T Forbes, David G cave, Terry, I think I'm saying it right. Quirky or quark, quark, uh, Q U I R K E Owen Hershey, David Oakham and Mark Haynes basically just took the time to say, thank you, George. Because you know the, all the enjoyment they've that you've, they've gotten out of your game, Mark Haynes went on to say, "Ask him how it feels to have created the greatest role playing game in all of the multiverse." <laughs> uh, I, I won't go that far, but when I was younger, 
I made some goals for myself. And one of them was I wanted someone I had never met to enjoy something that I had helped create. And Hero and Champions was really the first time that ever happened to me. And it just it made me smile then and makes me smile now that that, that is the case. That there have there are people who've had a good time that they might not have had if I hadn't un, you know helped create this thing. They hadn't then taken it and made it their own. So yeah, that's <laughs> that 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 is a, an important part of feeling good about this kind of stuff. You know, whenever you can create something that Fantastic. people get joy out of, it's one of the greatest things you can do. I've I've literally talked to people. It's kind of opened my eyes. I mean, I always knew how important role playing games were to me personally and to others. But I've literally talked to people that have said role playing games either saved their life or got them mm-hmm. through incredibly tough times. So it's a hobby and it's for fun, but it means a lot to a lot of people. People people identify and attach to role playing games in you know very deep ways. Uh, so anyway, that's that's how it feels, Mark. Uh, it feels good. So Dominique Sumner, who actually runs the uh, He's a moderator. I think he started the world of supers RPGs on Facebook. Um, he has several questions, which you've already answered, but he's got one or two in here that um, I'm not sure that we've touched on. I want to give a shout out to Dominique, by the way, he does a lot of cool stuff on Facebook for superhero RPGs. And he posts a lot of cool stuff. And I personally try to research the history of computer role playing or not computer role playing of uh superhero RPGs, and I try to keep up with the new ones. So Dominique and his post are a big help in that. I'd say, and I think you may have touched on this a little bit, but he asked outright, he sent in five questions, but the only one you haven't already kind of addressed already uh, is if you could go back and do it again, what's, what is the, what you would change? Oh, that's hard. Um, because I mean, Champions and the Hero System and all those products were very much a were of their time. They were based on said the shoulders of giants. They were games that had come to before that we learned from. There are things that have happened in games since that we didn't know about. And um and there's lots of I, I would probably, as I mentioned, try to streamline it a little bit more. Um, I think there are ways that people have used since then to help um, streamline the game mechanics and uh, character creation and things like that. Um, I think I would try to make it easier for people to add flavor on the fly. Um, and even more ways for people to individualize their characters, maybe in more, uh, both flavor wise and game mechanic wise, look at games like, um, original cosmic encounter or magic or, um, other games where you have a core set of game rules and then individual characters can all kind of have their own game mechanic or their own little way of cheating game rules that flavor who that character is or the kind of thing that they can do. Um, and I think there's a lot of, would be a lot of interesting opportunities there to mix and match. I and mean, D&D does that nowadays with feats and such, where everybody has a little way to cheat mm-hmm. or to get an advantage or whatever. Um, so probably streamlining and, you know, finding a way to mix streamlining and, and variety and depth. Yeah. We didn't even get to go into that, you know, right out the gate, uh, champions had, you know, you could take disadvantages to get Mm -hmm. more points. 
and in you know eighty one that was that was a pretty a pretty powerful concept. It's the idea of like an energy blast, you know, energy blast is an energy blast is an energy blast. How it appears is is character flavor and may have like a special right. advantage or a little side advantage or something that you could build into <laughs> it. Yeah, it's impressive to me how how powerful the rules were and how for a 64 page rule book for a superhero rule book with superpowers in it. I mean, that's, that's really impressive that you packed all that in there. We're always some people um, that couldn't quite, so if you, couldn't quite get the whole idea that, you know, well, I want a fire blast. We'll take an energy blast and call it fire. Well, but I want a fire blast, you know, some people yeah, got it it's... and some people didn't. And I don't think we always catered to the people who didn't as well as we could have. Well, you know, and and that touches on a game design philosophy. It's like, at what point do you have to put the boundaries up and say, this is the game we are, mm-hmm. you know, because at a certain point, if you try to be everything to everybody, nothing to anyone. You know, <laughs> you, yeah, that's very hard. <laughs> so next, uh, Ian Corman, uh, said, how is the business impacted by TSR's release of Marvel superheroes? For all I know, it could have driven significant additional interest in the genre, uh, in addition to its competitive market effects. Do you, me- do you remember either the Marvel or DC games rippling sure. against you no, guys I mean, at all? I remember when they came out, um, they were big deals at the time. And in a lot of ways, they helped bring more interest into the genre. Uh, I also thought they were really interesting games from a game mechanic standpoint and included some stuff that we didn't necessarily do as well. I mean, every game has the things it does well. Um, I don't remember it having a significant negative impact on our sales. Um, By then, we had a pretty solid audience. Um, I think mostly what it did is it brought more people into trying out superhero games. And some of those people ended up trying our stuff and playing it. And I'm sure there's probably some people that played our games that tried out Marvel superheroes or, or DC and decided, Hey, this is more like what I want in the long run though. I, my experience has been that players didn't really like playing licensed characters. They wanted to play their own character and then get a chance to interact with, licensed characters and i think that was a mistake that at yeah. the beginning when people brought these games out they thought oh people are going to want to play superman or they're going to want to play spider-man the real answer was well, they wanted to play super guy or spider guy <laughs> and be next to them or be better than them <laughs> yeah I remember reading somewhere that originally Marvel Comics Group didn't want TSR to put a character generation system in Marvel superheroes at all. Because they really just thought, well, why why do that? Everybody's just going to want to play Wolverine or, you know, whoever. And no, you're absolutely right. That's that's not how gamers think. Yeah, gamers are creative, strangely enough. <laughs> uh, yeah, they want to... I mean, it is fun, like maybe on a one-shot or something, to to Batman or Superman or something or Greenland. Yeah, in an early champions tournament I was in, you know, they basically had the players running the X-Men. This was before Marvel superheroes came out. You know, I've still got the character sheet for Nightcrawler laying mm-hmm. around somewhere. Uh, yeah. If I remember, and this is, we're on a tangent. Oh my goodness. Gamers are on a tangent. Who can believe it? Um, the, uh, the, yeah, the character generator for Marvel superheroes didn't come out to the advanced rules. If I remember right. Um, no, there was a very had, simple one in the back. Was there in the advanced book there um, in the box set? Because yeah, I mean it was literally like two pages. You just roll random powers, oh, okay. and that was it. I do give credit to Marvel superheroes because they said their. I think I think it was like Jeff Grubb or somebody said, like the goal was, like a, an RPG that a ten year old could pick up and easily begin playing. Mm-hmm. And I think they nailed that. So I, th- I think they did a Especially good job. Especially with the yellow that. box yeah. set. Yeah. Yeah. That's what, that's exactly what I mean. Yeah. Um, okay. Anyway, uh, John Lamb 
uh, said, also pass along the thanks for all the fish. Uh, but then he said, uh, <laughs> were you and the other creative team members math nerds, or did you all use the math forward mechanics because it just seemed like the best option inspiration <laughs> at the time? And I think you've already kind yeah, of addressed I mean, this, I was a, I was a bit of a math nerd. The more well. algebra, the better. <laughs> Ah. Did you have a did you have a slide rule? I did. I actually I'm an old man by now as because the game was came out a long time ago. Mine was the last high school class that had in my school district that had to take slide rule um as a one as a half semester of at the same time that you took uh, trigonometry. So one once a week our trig class, we would have slide rule class. And uh, so wow. I was right at the same time when scientific calculators were getting down to about a hundred bucks. You know what you can get now for $12 or $6 or whatever. Um, right. Or free apps. <laughs> yeah. Free app. Uh, so I, I'll tell you, I've never used a slide rule, but. I know a lot of mathematicians or gamers or whatever that swear by them or have sworn by them in the past. And I've seen some video appear. I mean, some people can use them like a gunslinger. I mean, they're like, it's pretty amazing what you can do with a slide. Uh, I haven't touched one in many, many moons. So, <laughs> but if you picked one up, would it shine with a, a light from the heavens and you'd go hello? Uh, no, probably not. I'm, <laughs> <laughs> okay we need a hero that has a magical slide rule and he turns into like slide what rule math man those yeah, are those the cool thing <laughs> <laughs> no the the arch nemesis is abacus is slide rule versus abacus his arch nemesis all right um so yes you are a self-confessed math nerd all right paul reed said i've always wondered who are the two characters fighting on the cover of first edition <laughs> champions? And then Mike Spagnola spoke up and said, the villain is Holocaust. He's not sure the, who the hero is, but it looks like a prototype for ice star. Um, actually Mark Williams drew those two and he just did them out of his imagination. Yeah. Later we may have actually used them, uh, actually named them and used them somewhere, but, uh, mostly they were just arcs, prototypical hero and villain. I remember reading somewhere that it was Starburst, but but we've got it from the at at the beginning they were generic but cool looking hero right. and villain, yeah. unnamed. They were proto whoever they became later. Um, all right, Randy Swim Daddy Swindler, <laughs> yes, that's his name. Uh, and I'll let you both answer this one. Um, Who'd win in a Street Fighter? And I, I imagine they mean like a Street Fighter video game. Gargoyle or Bulldozer? Well, actually, mm. ran the the game that included Mark Williams playing Gargoyle. And so, in my mind, I'm thinking of Gargoyle after having played many years and having gained boatloads of experience in which case you know he was <laughs> put it mildly he was a monster <laughs> um it was uh <laughs> it was a challenge to uh challenge those guys by the time they'd been playing for a long time but uh so in my mind it'd be gargoyle well i mean you know if nothing else he's got the flight advantage there you go um and i can i you know i would hate if i was a game designer I would hate to have to factor in flight because most fights are happening to, you know, superhero games have that in, in some fantasy games too, you deal with flight, but both the speed and the three dimensional, uh, yeah. aspect that it adds to that, that has to be harder to design for that and super speed. Um, by the way, I really like, uh, George, your, your matrix for who, <laughs> who goes on what segment. Like I've seen some people like, oh, that's not how I, but I like that. I would have loved that if I had bought that, you know, 
Champions when it first came out. Most of the time, I defaulted my characters to speed six just so that I knew I only went on on even <laughs> whatever segments. Yeah, I love tables and charts, and that made my little thirteen year old heart happy. Um, so, oh, here's some nice trivia, Mike. You know that you know in in the AD and D first edition Player's Handbook, or maybe the DMG. Never read it. I think it's the Player's Handbook where. Um, where it shows how different races react to each other. Oh yeah, the like Hatrix. Dwarves. The Hatrix, yes. <laughs> Mike has named that the Hatrix. <laughs> Not to make it's a matrix of hate. Which characters <laughs> hate the other characters? You know it's you uh, know the chart I'm talking about, George? Exactly, yeah. A D and D where it was like dwarves like humans, but they don't like oh. elves. And yeah, so yeah, so DM Mike has has dubbed that the Hatrix. All right, Bill Mann. He threw three questions out here. Uh, we're we're pretty much over time now, so I'll just ask one. Um, what is your favorite archetype and why? Deep in my soul, I'm a brick. Um, the idea of running around and doing all the super strength tricks and things like that. Um, sort of the essence of superheroing to me is the way you kind of use and abuse the environment as part of the battle. So. Oh yeah. Here to hit. Yeah. Now if you, if you're not ripping up a lamppost and, and baseball batting somebody with it, something's wrong. Yeah. You're not having a real superhero fight. If there's not pipes busting up from the street, yeah, you're not trying. Yeah. The infrastructure in a superhero world must be top notch because they have to constantly <laughs> replace it. Do that, or it's just really cheap, and they yep. replace it trivially all the time. <laughs> <laughs> it's like cardboard. It's like corrugated cardboard. Legos. It's just, yeah, it's <laughs> laminated cardboard. Yeah, Legos. So that's where you got to think. You can't think too deeply about it. You know, it's like because nobody would after like ten years of Marvel comics. Nobody would live in New York City anymore, right? <laughs> like, I'm out of here. And uh, so you, there's a certain level that that suspension of disbelief, you just got to go, okay. Submariners invading the surface world again. We used to say, if you haven't taken a disadvantage for your cape, then the bad guy can't use it against you. you no, know, because otherwise nobody would wear a cape <laughs> and we want people to wear capes. Yeah, in the real world, a cape would be a massive disadvantage. Okay, no but they just look so cool. You know, I just I would have a detachable cape. If it got tugged on too hard, it would pop. It off. would just attach, I guess. Yeah, but then it can't save you at the last minute when the when the cape rips mm -hmm. on the gargoyle as you're falling, right? And it and it holds Catches you. you at the last See, minute. Then it can't, yeah, yeah, you can't you can't do that anyway. All right, um, final question, uh, Rob. Uh, it's either Weiner or Wiener, W-I-E-N-E-R. Um, he had two questions. One we've already answered. The other one, I'm not sure if you can answer this, George, because I think you said you don't have a lot of experience with 5th and 6th edition. But he says, you know, what do you think of what the hero system has become, like what it's grown into after all these years? I will admit I, I don't really have a strong opinion on 5th and 6th edition. Um, I just kind of stayed playing the 4th edition hardback. So I um, gotcha. suspect that they've made decisions, some of which I would think, what a great idea, and other ones I'd kind of go, hmm, not the choice I'd have made, but I don't actually know. But is it, is it I would assume, um, you know, but feel free to, to uh, tell me I'm wrong. So th that was 40 years ago when Champions First Edition first came out. Yeah, sounds a long time, doesn't it? It is, but isn't it kind of amazing as a co-creator that it's to still see around, still going yeah. with other people? You yeah. know, it's amazing, and the fact that it moved people to do that—that's one of the great ways of my life. Is you'll still get something out of it. It's cool. Well, if I understand right, I could be wrong. I am not intimately familiar with Sixth Edition, but if I understand right, the credits in the character book go to the community 
So it might be more of a community effort at this point. It says, let me see if I can find it. It said something like um, the fan community to, or, you know, in the credits. So I'm not, I'm not sure what the, it says, yeah, it says writing a design. This is in the Game Master book. It says cool. the hero fan base. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and it says it may be copied, printed, and distributed for personal use as long as you do not try to sell it at any price. So, is it sounds like the fans have taken it over. Um, you know, I, I can't speak to the fifth edition. Um, and th- this is Champions Begins, by the way. That's the name of this one. Uh, and it's using the Hero System 6th edition. Cool. Well, guys, I got to draw us down. Y'all have both been incredibly gracious with your time. I, you know, George, I'm sorry that I revealed the fact that you're secretly Fox Bat. <laughs> but after four, after four decades, <laughs> it was going to come out sooner or later. Uh, he pinned it so, on Bruce Harlick. It's all right. Did. <laughs> oh, that's right. I forgot. <laughs> yeah, he had, he, had his, uh, he had his cover suit <laughs> ready to go. <laughs> Well, any okay, any final thoughts? I'll start with Mike and then we'll finish with George. Any final thoughts, Mike, before we wrap up this wonderful conversation, which I've enjoyed very much? Uh, I suppose that there's still no supers game that I enjoy running more than first edition champions. It's very cool. Three years later. Yeah. It's very cool. Thank you, Mike. You are quite welcome. And I'd like to add if, you know, I know, I don't know how much of the con circuit you do, but Mike and I both attend North Texas RPG con, which has newer games, but it also has a heavy, you know, old school game presence. And a lot of the original creators show up. So if you're ever looking for a new con to go to, definitely love to have you. And, you know, I could put you in touch with the organizers. Good to know. Appreciate it. So... George, any any final thoughts? Anything you want to mention? Uh, just to say to thank you very much, Shane, both to you and to Mike. This has been a lot of fun. I appreciate you setting it up and running it and being a great host. And, you know, for, for everybody that's had a good time running any of the Hero games, uh, you know, thank you for having a good time. Makes me happy. So. And and George is not Fox Bat. George is not Fox Bat. It's Bruce Harlan. There's no evidence so. to otherwise. The evidence that we have that George is Fox <laughs> Bat has been redacted. So don't ask me any questions <laughs> about it. Um, all right. I have to do this. I always end the show with the bad joke of the week. Even though the podcast is only like once or twice a month now, I still call it the bad joke of the week because that rolls off the tongue better. Right? It's so bad it lasts two weeks. So. <laughs> It does. It's so bad. It will last you till the next one. All right. Uh, I assume both of you received your waivers that you signed that prevent me from being sued for psychic damage. Uh, there any mental pain? All right, here we go. Why do cow milking stools, why do cow milking stools only have three legs? I don't know. Why do cow milking school stools only have three oh. legs? Because the cows got the udder. Mm. Oh. <laughs> yes. That's the correct response. And that's when I <laughs> shot him, Your Honor. My heart, Your Honor, my heart. It just didn't, it, it, it didn't hold up anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Elizabeth, I'm coming to join you. <laughs> oh, man. I think I've told this one before, but what do you call a, what do you call a cow with no legs? Wait a minute. We we only were contractually <laughs> obligated to deal with one. <laughs> this is the bonus round. Yeah, I'm giving you about it's ground beef. That would be ground oh. beef. So <laughs> uh. oh. all right, I'm gonna let y'all go. I know it's uh, I know we're all we're I know we're all working folks here and this is our evening. So thanks so much again. Folks, check out uh, DM Mike and DM Liz and DM Corbett and D- it's DM Jim, right? DM. Yeah, Jim yeah. yeah, 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 from Mutant Craw Classics on the Save for Half podcast, and check out DM Mike and DM Liz on the Crusader podcast. Uh, George, are you doing anything that you'd want to promote at the moment? Nope, nothing right now. Okay, we'll catch George in editions one through four of Champions in the Hero 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 System. That's where you can catch George. Um, 
George, thanks again so much. And, and folks, go to the show notes. Check out the other interviews and podcasts and stuff about what George is up to. I guarantee you'll be fascinated. Um, all right. Well, that's it, everybody. We will catch you next time on Shane Plays Geek Talk. Thanks so much for listening to Shane Plays Geek Talk. I certainly hope you enjoyed this journey into the things we love. For your convenience, show notes with helpful links for each episode can always be found at shaneplays.com. You can catch the podcast in several places, including on the blog at shaneplays.com, iTunes, Google Play Music, Stitcher, Podbean, Amazon Music, Verbal, YouTube, and more. If you like what you hear and would like to support Shane Plays Geek Talk, you can do so for as little as $1 per episode on Patreon at patreon.com slash shameplays. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you next time. Stay geeky, my friends.